1969, the year that man first set foot outside his own planet. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Ready? And a half. Contact light. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. British troops moved into Northern Ireland to keep the Catholic and Protestant communities apart. In another technological triumph, the world's first supersonic airliner made its maiden flight. And in total contrast, Queen Elizabeth II crowns her son Prince of Wales. On December the 29th, between Christmas and New Year's Eve, a lady vanishes. Her name is Muriel Mackay, and she is the wife of Alec Mackay, the deputy chairman of Rupert Murdoch's new acquisition, the News of the World Group. Mr. Mackay arrived home at 7.45 that Monday evening. Home was St. Mary House, Arthur Road, Wimbledon, near the famous tennis club. Over Christmas, he was using the company Rolls-Royce. Later, he described what he had found on the night his wife disappeared. When I rang the doorbell, as I normally would do, and I, nobody came, I waited for a few moments, rang it again, thinking she may be upstairs, and then I tried the door, the chain was not on it, the inside chain. As you've already noticed, there are two sets of doors, an outside and an inner set. I opened the door only to find the front door open. I then thought, saw things scattered on the floor which had come from her handbag. Uh, then on one side of me I noticed this machette. The uh, chair was some disarrayed. I then walked into the room at the back of this uh, room that we're now in and there was a fire burning there. My wife left this house against her will, for, in my opinion, not only from what I saw there, but in fact she had a great fear of fire. She was meticulous that she would always put the screen in front of that fire if she was going out for any time. Now, I think no man in the world could say that his wife wouldn't leave him. Uh, I really believed that she wouldn't leave me. Uh, I'm quite sure that she wouldn't leave the dog in front of an open fire. After Mr. Mackay phoned the police, he called the editor of The Sun, one of the papers under his control. This angered the police, who were still uncertain as to how to approach the disappearance. But just after midnight, a call from a phone box at Bell Common, Epping, reached the Mackays. A voice said, We are Mafia M3. We tried to get Rupert Murdoch's wife. We couldn't get her, so we took yours instead. You have a million by Wednesday night, or we will kill her. Get the money, or you won't have a wife. Now, Chief Superintendent Bill Smith knew what he was up against. Uh, uh, we believe she's been abducted. We're treating this as an abduction. Mr. Mackay came home last night expecting to meet his wife, who uh, should have been indoors. The doors were open. Uh, his wife wasn't there. Their uh, uh, shoes were on the stairs, uh, going out shoes. If she'd have been walking out, uh, she would have been wearing these shoes. But her driving shoes are missing, and her car is in the car park, in the uh, garage. The kidnappers called again to say that a letter from Mrs. Mackay had just been posted. Did you get the money, they asked, and allowed their victim a brief word on the phone. The following morning, the promised letter arrived, scribbled all over the page, probably due to the writers being blindfolded. Please do something to get me home, she wrote. I think of you constantly. What have I done to deserve this treatment? The police decided to keep the content secret, but to their fury, the papers all had it the next day. Mr. Mackay was a newspaperman, and newspaper men believe in the power of the media. He encouraged his daughter Diane and her husband to go on the television news to appeal to the kidnappers. 
This again annoyed the police, who felt it would just lead to a lot of nuisance calls. Please, just let my mother come back. There's no reason why she should be taken. It must be a crank, because to ask a million pounds ransom is just incredible anyway. And my mother hasn't any enemies. She's, she's happily married? Very happy. We're a very happy family and always have been. And, well, there's no, no reason. It's incredible. Superintendent Smith's main worry was that any move to trap the kidnappers could result in Muriel Mackay's death. He and his detective inspector, John Minor, were desperately frustrated by the lack of any clear leads or instructions from the kidnappers as to how to get Mrs. Mackay back. Well, hello, Gordon. Uh, you want to check in by you. If we can just sort one or two things out here. They led one of the largest teams of detectives ever assembled for such an inquiry, working from Wimbledon Police Station. Meanwhile, Alec Mackay was doing all he could to keep the case in the forefront of the public mind. Appeal to you to contact me by telephone, letter or telegram. My son or sons-in-law are ready to meet you or any intermediary anywhere on my behalf. On New Year's Day, the kidnappers had made their last call for 14 days, insisting on a million pounds and waving away the Mackay's objections that getting that sort of money was impossible for them. More letters arrived from Mrs. Mackay, but worryingly looked as if they had been written earlier in the kidnap. Hundreds of statements were collated by Detective Sergeant Jim Parker. Clutching at straws, the family asked an old friend, Eric Cutler, to fly to Utrecht to consult a Dutch clairvoyant, Gerard Croise, who had helped other police forces on dozens of criminal cases. I came over at the request of the family, whom I've known for a very long time and who are probably um, amongst my closest friends. Um, and Mrs. Mackay is one of the world's nice people, and I think everybody feels the same that they, they uh, certainly all her friends are desolate about this situation, and so one leaves no stone really unturned to try and find a solution to the to the problem. <clears throat> and uh, here seemed to be one possible way of trying to um, trying to locate her. Mr. Cutler took with him a photo of Muriel Mackay and a map of London and surrounding country. Was alive or dead. The medium told him that Mrs. Mackay was in a white farm, north-northeast of London. Nearby was another farm and a disused aerodrome. He added, if she is not found within 14 days, she will be dead. He's now uh, They have to do it very quickly. This view echoed that of America's FBI, which had been secretly consulted by the British police. While hundreds of police searched Epping Forest and other tracts of land nearby, others followed the medium's instructions to examine buildings on the borders of Essex and Hertfordshire. They reported finding only one deserted farm. All the while, it later turned out that Mrs. Mackay, or her remains, were in another farmhouse only a few miles away. Crank calls, and worse, false demands poured in. This is the editor of a local paper, the Hornsey Times. It starts, why should that organisation worry that I might murder Mrs. McKay? They pay out hundreds of thousands of pounds for the live stores of certain girls, so why shouldn't they pay me money for not murdering Mrs. McKay? I lost my 12-year-old daughter because she was influenced, here lectures, by all the money the girls got paid for telling their life stories. So Mr. McKay shouldn't complain or expect me to care what happens to his wife. A million pounds would not compensate me for the loss of my darling little girl. And then there's a postscript and the writer makes this condition that Mrs. McKay will be set free 
if the newspapers concerned publicly announce that, the, that they will not pay any more, that they will not print any more personal stories. As the hunt went on, more phone calls from the abductors reiterated the demand for a million pounds, now to be paid in two halves, but gave no instructions as to how it should be delivered. In an effort to pressure the silent kidnappers, the Mackay's doctor was set up to emphasize an almost wholly spurious illness he claimed she had. He claimed that she needed urgent medication. Is Mr. Mackay is in very great danger. He's in, in a definite danger because she has been under great stress before, and I have treated her before under stress. What specific danger is she in? From a heart attack or from the arthritis? Well, heart could be affected, of course. She does need these injections, so she Definitely, yes. keep her out of pain. Yes. It's important that she gets the injections. Very important. Very quickly. How often does she get them? About three, three a month. The family continued their public appeals. The statement from Mr. Mackay says, would you please inform me what I have to do to get my wife back? What do you want from me? I'm willing to do anything within reason to get my wife back. Please give me your instructions and what guarantee I have that she will be safely returned to me. I have had so many persons communicate with me that I must be certain that I'm dealing with the right person. At last, on the 1st of February, instructions were received for Ian, the Mackay's son, to bring half a million pounds to a crossroads on the A10 main road north of London. His place was taken by a detective sergeant, with an inspector acting as the chauffeur of the Rolls Royce. But the other police presence was too obvious, and the kidnappers didn't take the bait. Mr. Mackay appealed again. Of course, I am terribly worried, I am frantic, that I can get my wife back again. What can I do? I'm only asking the cooperation of everybody who may be watching, who may be listening, or may be reading, to please help us to get her back again. Fortunately, the kidnappers didn't give up. Warning that they wouldn't tolerate another attempt at an ambush, they set a new date for the handover, Friday the 6th of February. This time, Alec Mackay had to take the money himself in two suitcases, accompanied by his daughter, Diane. Again, detectives played the parts, with another one hidden in the boot of the car. After going to several telephone boxes, they were ordered to go by tube to Epping and wait for a phone call at the station. The call told them to take a taxi to Bishop Stortford, leave the money opposite a minivan which would be parked on the forecourt of Gates Garage and return to Epping. Rob Kelly, the taxi driver, retraced that drive, still under the impression that the detective was the real Alec Mackay. I went to Epping station and uh, I met Mr Mackay and a woman. He was wearing a fur hat camel hair coat. He said, we've got someone else to pick up at the top of the road. I said, right. So we set off again, pretty scared by now. And when we got to Bishop Stalford Gates Garage, which he, you know, he said he wanted to go to, he said, I want you to drive down past the garage slowly, turn back onto the main road, come in back on the road again, and when I tell you to stop, pull up as near to the hedge as possible and stop. The cases were left as instructed. But again, there was a farcical ending when a husband and wife saw the cases and reported them to the local police, who knew nothing about the station. ransom. They said, we've got to, I've got to wait here for a phone call. At 20 to 1, he got the phone call. He said, it's all right now, we can go to Saving Boys. He paid me, he said, uh, it's all been a joke. He said, we'd appreciate it very much if you didn't say anything. Disguised watchers had spotted a dark blue Volvo License number XGO 994G. It had kept slowing as it passed the cases. A check on the number plate revealed it was owned by a Mr. Arthur Hussein of Rooks Farm, a small holding in the village of Stocking Pelham, on the borders of Essex and Hertfordshire. The next morning, the police descended in force, surprising Arthur Hussein and his brother Nizamuddin. There was no sign of Muriel Mackay but they found the exercise book out of which the pages had been torn for her to write her letters home.
They also found another billhook, like the one in Wimbledon, a sawn-off shotgun and a tin of elastoplast, identical with one left by the kidnappers at the Mackay's house. And they found some paper flowers, like ones which had been left to mark the spot for the first abortive ransom drop. Arthur Hussein's fingerprints match those on the ransom demands, the envelopes, and a cigarette packet in the Epping phone box. All these provided a direct link between the two Hussein brothers and the Mackay's home in Wimbledon. The police had no doubt that they had caught their kidnappers, but despite an inch-by-inch inch search of Rook's farm and its surroundings, they could not find any evidence that Muriel Mackay had ever been held there. Initially, the police decided to charge the brothers for kidnapping and blackmail only. Arthur and Nizam Hussein had been born in Trinidad, the sons of a tailor who was an elder of the local mosque. Arthur had come to England in 1955 and worked with some success as a tailor's cutter above a jeweler's in Hackney. After a six-month sentence for desertion during his national service, he settled in Essex with his German wife Elsa, whom he had met during his army service. Arthur's fanciful dream was to become a local squire, and he borrowed heavily to buy Rook's farm in May 1968. He applied for membership of the local hunt, but he couldn't ride a horse or afford the subscription. Neighbours were swiftly antagonised by his arrogant and high-handed behaviour, which became worse as his financial problems increased. At 21, Nizam was the youngest of seven Hossein brothers and had always been wild. Weak-willed, he was easily led by the wily Arthur. The kidnap plot was hatched in October when they saw Rupert Murdoch being interviewed on television. The talk was about the millions of pounds it had recently taken to buy the news of the world and the sun. How could they get their hands on some of that money? Simple. Kidnap Mr. Murdoch's wife, Anna. The brothers followed the chairman's Rolls Royce home. Now, as they thought, they knew where Anna Murdoch was to be found. What they didn't know was that the Murdochs were away and that the Mackays were using the rolls. With Arthur's wife and children in Germany for Christmas, they had Rook's farm to themselves. Ironically, the police had called twice at the farm in the 24 hours before the kidnapping. The first time they were making inquiries about an assault on an elderly farmer the previous week, but they couldn't manage to connect the Hosseins to it. The next morning, another policeman arrived at the farm this time because Nizam had earlier complained that his brother had beaten him up in an argument over a girl. Nizam reassured them that it was all settled and the police went away again. Later that day, the brothers set out for Wimbledon. How they got Muriel Mackay, normally extra cautious, to unlock the door of the house in Arthur Road to them was never discovered. But once they were in, they made short work of any resistance she put up. It's known that Arthur carried the billhook hidden in a copy of the People newspaper because his palm print was on a page found in the house. And the brothers were not likely to have been made any gentler by the discovery that they hadn't kidnapped Rupert Murdoch's wife after all. Despite the most careful searches of the farm and the surrounding countryside, the police never found any traces of Mrs. Mackay. Local people spoke ominously of the hungry and savage dogs that the brothers kept. Although the police put on an optimistic face, they were certain that Mrs. Mackay was dead and later added murder to the charge of kidnapping.
nothing whatsoever. Nothing. We've had reports that uh, there have been fingerprints uh, found in the farmhouse which you've connected to Mrs. Mackay. Is there anything in this, Inspector? No, I'm unable to comment on this. There was a report, too, that a shallow grave had been found. Can you comment on that? No shallow grave has been found. Was the body of an animal? We feel that Mrs. Mackay is still alive. Well, we're hoping so, yes. Do you, have you any evidence that suggests we she is no not? no evidence otherwise. No evidence at all. Arthur and Nizamuddin Hussein came to trial on Monday, September the 14th, 1970. They were prosecuted by the Attorney General, Sir Peter Rawlinson, and each brother blamed the other. Arthur seemed to enjoy the attention, but Nizam made two suicide attempts and wept that Arthur always gets me into trouble. Although neither confessed, Nizam admitted making inquiries about the Rolls Royce, putting the artificial flowers on the ransom spot and driving the Volvo to look for the suitcases. He said he did all this under instructions from Arthur. Found guilty on all charges, Arthur was sentenced to life imprisonment plus 25 years for kidnapping, plus 14 years for blackmail, plus 10 years for sending threatening letters. Nizam got the same, except for 10 years less on the kidnapping charge. Inspector Smith and his team were delighted at their success in this extraordinary case without a body. While the brothers were driven off to serve their sentences, a sad trio walked away from the courtroom. Alec Mackay and his two children had lost a woman everyone had loved, who had been kidnapped and murdered by mistake.